Welcome to the Gospel Attic Podcast. I'm Greg Bryan. And I'm Jim Resty. We're gospel addicts because we believe the gospel of Jesus isn't just good news, it's the best news ever. We're addicted to the gospel because it doesn't just start us out in the Christian life, it is the Christian life. Join us as we look at the Bible through the lens of the gospel. Thanks so much for listening. Three different views of reality, and I want to contrast them with Christianity. The Eastern religions view that this whole world, everything is an illusion, not really real. In Greek and Roman thought, the idea was that there is matter, but the spiritual is good and physical is bad. So they would say that the manual labor, those kind of professions are the worst. Digging ditches is the worst. The thing you should try to aspire to do is be a philosopher, deal with the mind, right? Uh, because the spiritual is good and the physical is bad. And Christianity is very different. Just like Marius was saying, like the C.S. Lewis talks about this and others, God created matter. God loved matter. God created the world and rested from his work and said, this is good. We have a creator that starts off creation with his hands in the dirt. God loves that. So what is that? What are the implications of that? Work is work. All of your work is an extension of God's creative work. It's bringing order out of chaos. What God was doing in the beginning of time, when the spirit was moving over the face of the deep and everything was in chaos, God was taking that, bringing order out of chaos, order out of chaos. This is a different paradigm, a different way to view your work. It's bringing order out of chaos. It is an extension of the creative work of the father. So if you're a carpenter and you see all these two by fours and box of wood on your shop floor, you're going to take all that chaos and turn it into chairs and tables, cabinets, something beautiful. You're bringing order out of chaos. If you're an accountant, you see all these numbers and you're going to take these numbers, you're going to line them up and create these financial statements. They're going to let this business raise capital, fund itself, create jobs. You're bringing order out of chaos. If you're a lawyer, you're going to take words, put them together into contracts so people can rely on so they can work together. But this is a different way of looking at your work as an, ex an extension of the father's creative work and creation. And then what Maurice was just talking about, isn't work the curse of the fall? I'll hear people say this all the time. Yeah, I got to go back to work on Monday. Yeah, it's the curse. That's the curse. And the answer is no, work is not the curse of the fall. There was work before the fall. Just like Marius was saying in Genesis 2, God said, this is before the fall. I want you to cultivate the garden. There was work before the fall. Now, that was a, not a cursed garden because the fall hadn't happened yet. It was, they were working in a non-cursed world. So there was no corruption and decay. Then after the fall, God says, I still want you to work. There's just going to be lots of thorns and thistles. So you're working, the work's not cursed, but the world you are working in is. You're working in a cursed world, subject to corruption, decay. It's you still work, it's a lot harder. And the promise is that when, they, when Jesus comes and there's a restoration of all things, that you're going to be pursuing that creative work, that extension of bringing order out of chaos, pursuing that kind of work in a non-cursed world where there's no corruption, where there's no selfish ambition, no deceit, Work will be just like it was in paradise. Work will be easy again. And by the way, so about the reconciliation, this is true whichever view you take. We say it's all going to burn up. There's a new heaven and new earth, or this earth is going to be restored. Either way, that work in the new heaven and new earth, whichever view, is this going to be an extension of God's creative work in a new and restored perfect world. Now, in preparing for this, I was thinking if only there was a Bible passage that really directly connected work in this time period when between the first and second coming and work in the afterlife that directly talks about that. And fortunately, there is. It's a Bible story that's very familiar to most of us. It's usually not talked about for this proposition. So bear with me. We'll talk about it today. It could be its own Bible study, so it won't spend that much time on it. I only want to present it for this one proposition. It's the parable. Most of you will know it as the parable of the talents. In Matthew, it's called the parable of the talents. In Luke, it's called the parable of the minas. And of course, it depends on your translation. If you have the NIV, the, the Matthew version will be called the parable of the bags of gold. But the story is essentially the same. And the parable of the minas in Luke, I'll just read it to you. It's going to be very, it's not the whole thing. This is just the intro, but most of you know the story. This is Luke 19, verses, starting at verse 11. While they were listening to these things, Jesus went on to tell a parable because he was near Jerusalem. And they were supposed the kingdom of God was going to appear immediately. Now, let me stop there for a second. The intro here is really kind of important. And honestly, I glossed over this for a lot of my Christian life. The setting of this story is important. I just skipped that part of that. Wow, it's once upon a time. 
Once upon a time, there's a guy to go in, and then I went right to the substance of the stories. What's the lesson for me in the story? But the setting is kind of important because Jesus and Luke is saying, these people think my kingdom is coming immediately. I need to tell them that there's going to be a time span between my first and second coming. In the Matthew version, it's in Matthew 25. It comes right after Matthew 24. Matthew 24 is a long discourse that Jesus has about the end of time. And then in Matthew 25, he says, let me tell you about that. This is a story about the time period between the first and second coming. And then what it looks like after the second coming in the afterlife. Back to verse 12. So he said, a nobleman went to a distant country to receive a kingdom for himself and then return. Right? I'm coming back. I'm going to go away, but I'm going to come back. Verse 13. And he called 10 of his slaves and gave them 10 minas and said to them, do business with this until I come back. Verse 14, but his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we do not want this man to reign over us. Think about how Jesus puts himself in the story as the one who's hated. Verse 15, when he returned he, after receiving the kingdom, he ordered that these slaves to whom he had given the money be called to him so that he might know what business they had done. And the first appeared saying, master, your mina has made 10 minas more. And he said to them, well done, good slave, because you've been faithful in a very little thing. You are to be an authority over 10 cities. And then the rest of the story, you know, the one person goes back and he's like five. They get five cities. And then one of the last person had taken their mina, buried in the ground. And Jesus says, you wicked servant, take that mina away from that us, put, and give it to the one who has 10. And people in the crowd actually object and say, Lord, he already has 10. He says, I don't care. Give it to the one who has 10. So what, is, what does this mean? There's lots that impact in this little story. I'm just going to bring it up, like I said, for one proposition. The setting, I think, is important. It's the period of time between the first and second coming, and it connects that work now and the work in the afterlife. And it's a story about economic activity. The story literally says, I'm going to give you money. Do business till I come back. And then the ones who do that well get 10 cities in the afterlife. So something about cities in the afterlife, where there's actually economic activity. So it talks about that on its face. Now, the fascinating thing about this story is that if you look at commentaries, it's so easy to take your own biases and read those biases into the Bible as you're reading them. That's why this study is so important. So we can be men of the word, so we can really dig in the Bible and really study it and try to understand it. But people come to a passage like this with their own biases. So some commentaries you read, you say, ah, right here, full-throated support of capitalism. It's probably overstating the case because capitalism really wasn't fully invented at that time. Other commentaries will say, look, whatever the story means, whatever it means, it's absolutely not defending capitalism. Whatever it means, it definitely is not pro-business because we know that that's bad. It's all bad. It's all based on greed and self-interest, and that's anti-Christian, and we know that's bad. So whatever the story means, it definitely doesn't mean that. So people come to it with their own biases, Right. And the people that take that bias in the commentaries I read will say, I know it says business. I know it says dealing with money. I know it says that, but it doesn't mean that. What it's really talking about is using your gifts and talents, using your abilities to serve other people. They would read this passage and say, what this means, it's something like this. If you say you have the gift of singing, you're a good singer. That's really good. You should, you should use that gift of singing in the service of others. So you should join the church choir. It's the ability you have, so use that in the church, use that to serve others. That's the way they read it. And to be honest, to be really fair to those kinds of commentators, that's actually kind of the way I read this story, both this version of Luke and in Matthew, most of my Christian life. You've got certain gifts and abilities. You should use them. That's actually probably a decent lesson. But the story on its face is talking about economic activity. The actual story is talking about, you know, God believes says, I gave you money, do business till I return. So... What can we learn from the story without making too much or too little of it? It's a story about growth. God says, I've given you one mina, and then one guy comes and makes 10 out of it. In this version, everyone gets one mina. In the Matthew version, one gets five, one gets three, and so on. But they're both about growth. Growth. Why, why would growth be good? Why would God even want growth? Why would that even be possible? Why would God want that? And the answer is, growth means meeting needs. The person who has the one mina, God doesn't say how they made 10 minas out of it, but no matter what they did, they did it by meeting needs of others. They did it by growing their business or whatever it was. I have a nephew who's got a auto repair shop in Garfield Heights. He does great work and he does it cheaper than the dealership. He started up a couple of years ago, people are beating a path to his door. So he's hired another mechanic. He's taking out space in the shop next door, cleared that out, expanding his business. He's growing. Why is he growing? 
because he's meeting needs. Now, if he said something, I said, well, you know what? I don't want to do that kind of stuff. I want to do something else with my life. I, my dream is to work on dune buggies. I only want to work on dune buggies. We see, well, there aren't that many of them in Northern Ohio. You can do that if you want. And he says, I don't understand it. This is my dream. I'm living my dream. I'm doing this and, and my, my business is failing. Well, that's because you're not really serving anybody by only maintaining dune buggies in Northern Ohio. Good for you following your dream, but you're not serving anybody. So I say, well, my business isn't growing. If your business is growing, the way he's doing it now, you're meeting needs. The person who turned their one meeting into 10 is meeting needs of others. The one who takes their meeting and buries in the ground says, I don't have to do anything. I don't have to plug into society. I don't have to serve anybody. I just buried it in the ground. And what God is saying is like, when you are growing, whatever it is you're doing, so you're a carpenter. People love your work, and so you keep getting more. You're doing that because you're serving others, and you're plugging in. You're creating an interconnected society, and you're serving other people the way God wants you to. That's the point I want to take out of the story. And there's one more thing I want to mention this. At the end of the story, Jesus tells to the guy who has the one meter buried in the ground and says, why didn't you give it to the bankers? <laughs> and I love that verse because I work in the banking industry. I've been banking for 30 some years. So I love that verse. Now, I, I got to tell you, if, if, if Jesus, if I was in the restaurant industry and Jesus had said, you wicked slave, why didn't you give it to a restaurant? At least they could have fed people. I would say, yeah, there's, there it is. There's the restaurant verse. I love that verse. So I love this verse because it's my industry, right? But what does he even say, give it to the bankers? What does that even mean? Because when you give it to the bankers, they are taking the, the raw material, idle funds, and taking it and redistributing it to other people that can't put it to productive use for growth. Like in banking in general, you could take your own money right now and give it to some business startup. You could fund my nephew in Garfield Heights with a, with a dealership. You could do it yourself, but it's very hard to know what's gonna succeed, what's gonna fail. Banks are in the business of doing that. They'll say, well, we know what startups are good, which are not bad. We know about their cash flows, you know about their financial statements, how much equity they have, their debt to risk coverage ratios, all that stuff. Give it to the banks, and then the bank can at least put it to productive work. Jesus doesn't say, everybody give your work to the bank. He said, this one, that idle money, at least do that so it can be redistributed. Why, is it a pro-banking verse? Not really. It's saying, I just want to get this, this to work for productive use for growth, to serve others. Anyway, it's, I, I wanted to mention, because it's such a curious verse, give it to the bankers. And of course, I like that verse. <laughs> All right, Luther's view of work is probably more, far more important than that whole, that whole story about the uh, Minas. Luther's view of work, the priesthood of all believers. At the time of the Middle Ages, the time of the Protestant Reformation, there was a very clear hierarchy between spiritual work and non-spiritual work. That first view of work that I mentioned was the dominant view. So if you were in the priesthood, if you were a nun, if you were a monk, that was good. And all this other work was bad. They said this was the eternal state and this is the temporal estate. And we you know and you were earning merit because you're doing the work of the Lord and the full-time Christian ministry and everything else is really bad. Luther came by and talked about the priesthood of all believers, which is probably a phrase many of you have heard before. And he talked about that phrase in a treatise he wrote called an address to the Christian nobility of the German nation. And the point of the priesthood of all believers was to say there is no distinction between the priestly class, the full-time Christian work, and everyone else's vocation. Let's read this to you. He said, it is pure invention that the Pope, bishops, priests, and monks are called the spiritual estate, while princes, lords, artisans, and farmers are called the temporal estate. All Christians are the spiritual estate, and there is no difference among them except that of office. We are all consecrated priests by baptism. And he's playing off, and, he's, and, he's, and then he quotes the verse that says, you are royal priesthood, everybody. So he's saying there's no distinction. This is significant. He's also, and he expounds on, 1 Corinthians 7, verse 17, and another verse is in 1 Corinthians 7, that say, only let each person lead the life to which the Lord has assigned to him and to, to which the Lord has called him. And Luther said, that is the beruf, the German word for occupation, your profession. He said, the Lord has called you to your vocation, whether it's being called to the priesthood or being called to be a carpenter. God has called you that. That's your vocation. Both are equally valid in serving the Lord. It's a very different way thinking about your vocation, your work. But Luther was adamant about this, and that's the whole point of the concept of the priesthood of all believers. And he goes on to talk about this, and he gives examples, Luther does, of like the milkmaid and the farmer. And he says, you can stay in your kitchen and you can pray, oh Lord, please give me bread. Oh Lord, I need, food. I need milk. Please give me milk. And Luther says, God has the ability to make that bread and milk appear on your table for you. 
but he doesn't. He chooses not to do that. So how does he meet your needs? How does he answer your prayer? Well, there's a farmer out there who plows fields, grows wheat, someone else who mills that wheat, turns it into flour, someone else who takes the flour, bakes bread, someone else who takes that bread, ships it to a market, someone else who runs the market, someone else who sells it to you. All those people are the hand of God to you. That was Luther's idea. So if you say, God, give me bread, God says, I am giving you bread. How am I doing it? Through the work. Through the work of all these people, that is how I am meeting your needs. Same with milk and the milkmaid. Someone's out there milking cows. That is the hand of God to you to bring you your sustenance. That is how God's answering your prayer. When you see it that way, as long as you are doing work that is plugging into this world and serving others, all of your work, all that you do is the hand of God to somebody else, answering someone else's prayer for, for sustenance, for, to meet their needs. Very different conception of work. Now, why work? Two secular reasons to work. First, to make money. Second, to find an identity. To make money and to find an identity. These are the secular reasons to work. What are the Christians' reasons to work? They're found in 1 Thessalonians, back in 1 Thessalonians. Well, so we'll come back to this and read those now. But just to expound on this, so you, you, when you meet somebody for the first time, often you'll say, what do you do for a living? Because uh, our work is often the way we find our identity and we understand who we are. And then, uh, so those are the, the secular reasons to work. Let's talk about then the Christian reasons to work in 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 1 to 11. And then we get uh, Ray this time. If you could read this. Finally, brothers, we instructed you uh, how to live in order to please God. As in fact, you are living. It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality. Now about brotherly love, we do not need to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other. And in fact, you love all the brothers throughout Macedonia, yet we urge you, brothers, to do more and more. Make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, and to work with your hands, just as we told you, so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders, and so that you will not be dependent on anybody. That's great. So it's a couple things you notice in this passage. God says, finally, brothers, we instructed you how to live in order to please God. So this is instruction on how to please God, and we all want to please God. So you say, well, what's he going to say? Two things that you need to do in order to please God, in this passage anyway. First, avoid sexual immorality. Check. We all know that. And then he says, how do you, what else can you do to please God? And in verse 9, he launches into this idea of brotherly love. He says, we don't even need to tell you about this. You already know. You already know you're supposed to love each other. But then in verse 10, he says, you do love all the brothers throughout Macedonia. Yeah, we urge you, brothers, to do so more and more. So how do you love people more and more? How do you please God? And how do you love people more and more? Verse 11, make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, and work with your hands, just as we told you. So first, all a little side later, he says, work with your hands. That flew in the whole face of that Greek idea. By the way, we've seen this in Thessalonica, right? That Greek idea that manual labor is bad. He says, work with your hands. That's good. There's no, there's no hierarchy of jobs in God's hierarchy. But the way you're serving people, the way you're pleasing God, the way you're loving people is through your work. And that is that Luther's idea of the hand of God to you. You're serving people through your work. So one reason to work is this, to please God by showing love to others. Second reason to work from 2 Thessalonians 3. Rex? In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we command you, brothers, to keep away from every brother who is idle and does not live according to the teaching you receive from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example. We are not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's food without paying for it. On the contrary, we worked night and day, laboring and toiling so that we would not be a burden to any of you. We did this not because we do not have the right to such help, but in order to make ourselves a model for you to follow. For even when we were with you, we gave you this rule. If a man will not work, he shall not eat. We hear that some among you are idle. They are not busy. They are busybodies. Such people we command and urge in the Lord Jesus to settle down and earn the bread that they eat. And as for you, brothers, never tire of doing what is right. 
If anyone does not obey our instruction in this letter, take special note of him. Do not associate with him in order that he may feel ashamed. Yet do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. So a fairly lengthy passage on work and the importance of work. And I think for most of us, we'll read verse 10, and that leaps off the page. If a man will not work, he shall not eat. That's uh, pretty stark and pretty strong, right? So this is someone who has the ability to work and is refusing to work, and they, they're, uh, they're not busy, they're busy bodies. They're spending their time gossiping and talking and being idle and living off other people. So that's the verse that most of us will probably notice in this passage, and that, like I said, jumps off the page. The verse that I want to focus on, though, is verse 12. Such people we command and urge in the Lord Jesus Christ to settle down and earn the bread they eat. Earn the bread they eat. So in this world, you're, you're giving and you're taking. And what he's trying to say is you, you should be giving and making a contribution in this world more than you're taking. Right? Don't just take, someone else puts it, don't, don't just take from others, give as well. You should be plugging into this world and making a contribution in this world. So work, and, and I missed this, the whole thing starts in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We command you, brothers. So... On the topic of why work, it's the command of God. It's the command of God. We, we command you, brothers. It's the command of God and why to make a contribution to this world. So, why work? That verse in uh, 1 Thessalonians, lead a quiet life and work with your hands. A quiet life, inner quiet. A job that fits me, that is my, my like Luther said, my baruf, my occupation. Something that is a fit for you. That's okay to have a job that fits you. To have that kind of inner quiet. But then... A job that benefits the world. It fits me, but it's not for me. It's for, for the sake of others, working for others to make a contribution to this world, working for the Lord and not for men. And I'll just kind of end with a story here, and then we can take some questions and comments. My first job was when I was 15 years old, and I was, and actually it was illegal, I was underage, but a local McDonald's hired me anyway. And I, I worked from 4 a.m. to 8 a.m., cleaning the toilets, mopping the floors, cleaning the counters so the, so the McDonald's could open at 8 a.m. for customers. And I did that before school every day from 4 to 8 a.m. That was a pretty miserable job. By the way, if we start talking about the worst jobs ever, I'm sure some of you could top that with an even worse job, right? But I look back on that, I think that probably was not the worst job because it's, life has been not real, real toil since then. Just that job, at least I didn't have the stress of re responsibility. I was not responsible for a whole lot. Work is just really hard. And that's why I want to talk about it today. And uh, just to tell you a story. So coming from that job, I, a couple of years ago, I got a chance to serve on the board of directors at a, an organization called the Federal Home Loan Bank of Pittsburgh. And a lot of you probably have never heard of the Federal Home Loan Bank and the uh, FHLB, the whole system. The whole country is divided into 11 different Federal Home Loan Bank districts. The Federal Home Loan Bank, the FHLB system is actually the second largest issuer of debt after the US government. It issues trillions of dollars of debt, takes that money, provides that as liquidity to the banking system so that banks can make mortgage loans to others. Banks make a mortgage loan, take that money, pledge it as security against the borrowings from the FHLB, get that liquidity, and can make out more loans to others so that people can buy homes. And that actually, behind the scenes, unbeknownst to a lot of Americans, is the machinery that makes this whole system work, part of the machinery that makes this whole system work. And I served on the board there was a guy on this board that I really connected with. He's a great guy. We talked a lot. And then he got Lou Gehrig's disease and he was dying. So he kind of got off the board. And this guy, by the way, he had early in his career helped set up that whole system. He set up the whole system of how to finance this and how to set up the whole thing. And now he served on the board in the later days of his career, but he was dying of Lou Gehrig's disease. And so they went around, like a little bit like you do at a wedding, where they go around and give the, the microphone to everybody and take a video. Say, hey, give, give a greeting to John, because he's not here and he's really not doing well. And they didn't do it in front of everybody. We went to some little room and sat down and did a little video. And in my whole life, I, I, I never think of the right thing to say at the moment. I always think of the right thing to say 30 minutes later. And so they, they say, okay, they say, have a greeting to John, okay? And I, okay, so I thought about this and I said, I said, you know, John, I taught my kids my whole life that when they think about what profession they're going to do, what they're going to do, make a contribution to this world. Make a contribution to this world. Do something that fits you. Do something that you can, you can do that's a fit for you, but also that's not for you, that makes a contribution to this world. And I said, John, you've done that. You've been part of this whole system. You helped set it up. And I said, there's millions of people all over this country that are clicking on their stove this morning and cooking breakfast in a home that they have, the roof over their heads, because you had a part in making that all possible. You made a contribution to this world. So whatever happens to you, I'm praying for your recovery, but whatever happens to you, 
you've made a contribution to this world. And I want to thank you for that. And thank you for being an inspiration to me and to my children. And John said, and he threw me back. He said, oh, thank you so much. That helped me get through. Now, John didn't, you know, obviously, you know, at the end of the story, John's not with us anymore. Towards the end of his life, trying to say, what have I done with my life? What have I done with all my time? Made a contribution to this world, a huge contribution to this world, and could feel good about that. So that's actually all I wanted to talk about. We, now we can take time for questions, comments, more things. Lou. Jim, I, I thought this was really good. I, I, I think the pr practical aspect is terrific. And, and the work that we do is so important. We don't realize. We don't realize the interconnectedness. You know, the great tapestry. I don't know if, if uh, Pete Eklund is here today, but we were talking at Panera a few weeks ago, and he was talking about you see the tapestry in front, but you don't see all the the strings behind and how God has it all interconnected. It's just beautiful when you think about it. But what, what strikes me is that Jesus is, you know, the, the head of the church and he's working. Yes. You know, he's interceding for us, right? Yes. The Holy Spirit is interceding for us. God is working on our behalf, right? So we have the pleasure, the privilege, the greatest honor and privilege I think any man can have is working with God, for God, and helping you know, to, to show our love to God by doing work for him. And when you think about it, Jesus is, he's working. And I think we have to take the positive aspect. Cause I don't know if you covered this or not, but Luther was asked, what would you do if the Lord came tomorrow? And he said, I'd plant a tree. That's right. And that, and I think that goes into exactly what you're saying about restoration. I believe that there's a continuation and, and that God is going to take this earth and restore it. And I, th I think the scriptures are there in Hebrews. I think, I think it's there in 1 Corinthians 15 when Jesus is putting all things under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Amen. And God has put all things under his feet. And, you know, it's the fullness of him who fills all in all. So as long as we have that perspective that we're working for Jesus and he wants us to work, then I think you see that work can be enjoyable. Think back to what Eric Lytle said, you know, about, how when he ran, he feels God's glory. That's right. And that's what we have to feel in our work because it's all very important. We don't understand the importance of it. I think clerics were looked upon as somebody maybe superior. Yes. It's not like that. We all have our place. We all have our part and it all works together in the body of Christ. Amen. And since you mentioned it, what Lou mentioned was uh, Eric Little or Liddell. It's a story from the movie Chariots of Fire, which many of you have seen. And Eric Little, that was the, the Christian, he was running against a guy named Harold Abrams. And this comes out in the movie. Harold Abrams was a non-Christian. And he was, they were both, they were both sprinters and in a hundred yard dash. And Harold Abrams, the non-Christian, he said, when that gun goes off, I've got 10 seconds to prove my existence, to validate my existence. And many of us are working that way. He said, I've got to prove myself. I've got to justify my existence. And the other one, the Christian, Eric Liddell, who later became a missionary in China, he said, when I run, I feel God's pleasure. You know, and when I run, I feel God's pleasure. You know, another story is John Coltrane, who became a Christian, and he wrote, who did phenomenal music after that. And he wrote one of the greatest jazz albums ever called The Love Supreme. And he just said, when I play, I just, you know, the same thought. I'm just playing for the Lord, feeling his pleasure. But the gospel message in all of this, and since you brought it up, because you guys know why Jesus is working, is that we can rest from all this work. Because his work is finished, right? He did the real work for us of salvation. He said, it is finished, it is done. I love that. And everything else it's due, every other religion is due, and Christianity it's done. And he rested from his work so we can rest from ours. Which means you can enjoy it because I'm not, I, don't, I don't need to justify myself. I'm already justified. Yeah, so thanks for bringing that up. Another one over here. Yeah, Pat. Yeah, if I can follow up on this kind of theme that you have about does it all get burned up or... How do, how do we reconcile these various passages? So first, let me rehabilitate Greek philosophy by applying some Aristotelian logic. That could only help. <laughs> Man is part of creation, all the way back to Genesis. You might say the crown of creation. When you are, when you become a Christian, you are, quote, born again. You become a new creation. So this is the proof that when there is a new creation, as we read in Isaiah or Revelation, it's renewed because the Christian brothers here in this room, we will be with in eternity. They will have Flesh regenerated bodies, glorified bodies, you know, 
hopefully I'll have 2020 eyesight then, but yet I will be me and others will recognize me as who I am. And so, yeah, we, we can't say it's all burned up. Right. It just, it, it doesn't make sense within the Christian worldview. Yes, and, and to pile on to that, Pat, I often say, yes, you, you'll recognize me and I'll recognize you, but in the next life, I will be six feet tall. <laughs> Absolutely, with, with six pack abs and yes, exactly. Another. So what, what you helped us do today is give us an eternal perspective. If we're working and understanding that what we're gonna do here on earth is going to glorify the Lord and the body of Christ. That gives us the energy and the impetus to do what we're doing. Yes. And just like Eric Little, when I, when I run, I feel your pleasure. When we're doing what God designed us to do, it, it's not a chore anymore. Yeah. It's a joy. And that eternal perspective, uh, we're getting up in age, some of us. We have to keep in mind we've only got so many more days to do this. And how can we impact the world around us, live as an example to our children and grandchildren? The legacy we leave is how the joy in our life, what, what propelled us? Why? What was the point? I hope we can communicate that. And when he talks about the second coming, regardless of if it's tomorrow or whenever, let's not waste a minute and let's keep the eternal perspective. Hey Amen. That's great. Thank you. I'm going to close in prayer with one of the passages right from 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 23. So bow your heads. We'll pray this scripture together. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he who calls you, and he also will bring it to pass. Amen. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Gospel Addict Podcast. Feel free to contact us via email at gospeladdictpodcast at gmail.com. Stay tuned for our next episode. And remember, on your worst days, you're never beyond the reach of God's grace. And on your best days, you're never beyond the need of God's grace. See you next time.